Welcome to Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the Apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the Apocalypse engine. I'm your MC today, Rach, and I'm joined with my guest, Josh Fox. Welcome to the show, Josh. Hey, Rach. It's great to be here. How did you get your start in Powered by the Apocalypse? Weird story. My friend Nick picked up Apocalypse World and started raving about it pretty early on after it came out, I think. But for one reason or another, we didn't actually start playing Apocalypse World for some time. We were in the middle of a a Warhammer fantasy roleplay campaign, and he decided to hack the Apocalypse World mechanics into the Warhammer game. How did that work out for you? Did it go well? <laughs> it was pretty good, actually. Yeah, it's a. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Woofer Up. It's the old second edition percentiles game. He essentially what he did was graft in the kind of um, the seven to nine uh, middle middle result bit of Apocalypse World and the GM moves, so that uh, from what is a pretty uh, kind of r- r- a, quite a whiff whiff heavy game if that makes sense that you know that uh, there's a, a lot of roll and nothing really interesting happens suddenly became very interesting i am familiar with the term whiff but to go into detail uh could you explain to some of our audience members who might not have heard that term before yeah so i mean i don't know whether i'm using the term correctly as i understand it whiff is essentially where you roll and miss and nothing interesting happens as a result it's just oh you failed boring and to be honest i think also at times this is not how you use this term whiff but when you roll and succeed and nothing interesting happens too that can that can be the case and i think one of the things that uh, pbta usually does well is builds in interesting consequences regardless of what you roll in the dice because they're tuned to the specific thing you're doing and to the specific game you're playing yeah, and the, that seven to nine partial success, as people would describe it, I think does solve some frustrations that I know, speaking for myself, I have with Whiff. And I could see that working out really well in an older game like Warhammer Fantasy, where there is that I keep throwing my dice and nothing happens. What's the point of all this experience? Right, exactly. I mean, this was a really simple, This you could use this for Call of Cthulhu as well. You know, anything anything that uses a... A sort of uh, roll and succeed or fail system i think he simply says uh if you miss by less than 40 percent or something then we'll have something interesting happen of a middling kind of variety uh, and that was pretty good i guess the other thing that he brought to it was the community focused aesthetic of apocalypse world so we were playing in a city which had a a ruler who was he was effectively quite clearly using him like an NPC hard holder, right? Mm-hmm. And all of the action was taking place in and around there, and and you could see he was generating interesting threats. We had Rourke. Rourke is always there, right? So fucking Rourke showed up in a Warhammer fantasy roleplay game. That's my first experience with Rourke. I, I don't like him. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was a good game, and led on to playing Apocalypse World and many other pbta games let's start off with our first segment read a sitch where the guests and i discuss some aspect of powered by the apocalypse play or table culture that they want to spotlight read a sitch. josh you left some notes for me that you wanted to talk about the first session of powered by the apocalypse games and how we can make it a better experience mm, yeah i guess this is coming from quite a specific perspective For me, one of the things that I really like about PBTA games, or many PBTA games at any rate, is you have a really cool kind of action-oriented bit that generates cool moves snowballing and excitement, and then you have a really interesting interpersonal drama bit where you get to know your characters and find out how they relate to each other and bounce off each other. And the problem that I've experienced with first session sometimes is If you go too hard on the action, you don't really get to explore your characters at all. It's just things exploding all the time and you're kind of running and hiding or shooting each other or whatever. And it's a little bit, your characters get a bit isolated, maybe, Mm -hmm. versus going too hard into the interpersonal drama bit, then you might not yet have set up enough tension between your characters and enough interesting what just happened type situation 
to make those conversations tick. I think that's quite a tough balance to strike sometimes. And that could be a really tricky balance, especially with players who are learning the game for the first time. Yeah, I think that's right. What I tend to find with certainly my early experiences with PBTA, things were either snowballing way out of control and I couldn't kind of get a moment to express pause and express my character in conversations with other people or we're just kind of talking to each other and we're almost reliant on things like choosing to read a person or what have you to inject momentum into an otherwise potentially lifeless is a bit strong but (laughs) you get what I mean right Uh, no I, I I'm picking up what you're putting down the game can feel a little dull and not inspiring Josh do you have an example of ways that players could improve their first session to have a more enjoyable experience yeah so so the example from my recent play experience was almost kind of discovered by accident we're playing a game of bite marks so that's my partner becky's game about werewolf packs bite marks is really in that space that i just described right you're werewolves so sometimes you're going to rip things apart and fight and get into the action of being a werewolf but really the focus of the game is about those relationships, the pack relationships between the characters. And to make those relationships really interesting, you have to have something that you're going to be springboarding off. So the bad guys in this campaign had been established in character creation as the Redcoats. So they're these hunters who, this is a kind of an English thing. I don't know how how recognisable this is to US or other side of the Atlantic um, audiences these kind of upper class people who ride around on horses and shoot foxes basically so in our game they shot werewolves that was what they like to do hunt werewolves and kill them and so we set up an initial situation we didn't play through this at all we just used questions to establish what had happened that the characters had just been in a fight with the redcoats i think they'd been kind of ambushed they thought they were going to go and beat up the redcoats and they got ambushed instead Their leader, who's an NPC, the Alpha, got shot. Another NPC, a beloved younger character, got kidnapped and taken away. And they'd all had to run away to return back to the home of of Ruby, the Grey Pelt, one of the player characters. So the first scene was the pack Alpha lying on Ruby's kitchen table, bleeding out. One of the characters was the Prodigal. This is a character that has been away and is coming back so we started with them actually outside of the group so they could be brought back in and this whole kind of situation instead of starting as some pbta games you know the original kind of advice from apocalypse world is we're just going to follow you around we're going to see what you're doing you know find out what your life is like Mm -hmm. all cool maybe you know obviously it's it's apocalypse world so people are going to throw in stuff and it's going to start to snowball and get interesting but in this case what we've done which i have tried to formalize and mechanize in last fleet is to establish that something has already happened that you're going to want to talk about and it worked really well that's kind of it really it's that to me like the faster you can get to those interesting interpersonal conversations the better and you turbocharge those first conversations by providing something to react to it also feels like a great opportunity to set the stakes of the world Here's your pack leader. They're bleeding out. What do you do about that? Is that important to your character? Right, exactly. And you know what? This is a lot like the love letters mechanic. If you have a a character who goes away and comes back, you know, you have a move where you say kind of what's been happening in your absence and we'll roll some dice and find out. I mean, this is a lot like that, except you do it straight away right at the beginning. It's as if you've been away and we find out what you've been up to we jump straight into your life in motion like you get up in the morning what do you put in your coffee Mm. is not as gripping as here's this immediate crisis do something about it exactly and so i mean we'll find out later on Uh, i think we've got plans to test this out right i'm excited for it but i think first we should move on to our next segment cool open your brain where josh and i are going to talk about last fleet yay open your Last Fleet. Josh, what's the setting? What's the game about? Right, so uh, Last Fleet is a game about a ragtag fleet of ships fleeing across space from an implacable, inhuman adversary 
that has destroyed their civilization and you play the characters on board that fleet the the pilots the officers the journalists engineers politicians who are trying to hold the fleet together under these incredibly difficult circumstances if that sounds a lot like Battlestar Galactica it is that's firmly what inspired me to write the game but the setting has got its own setting which is a little bit different but the fundamentals of kind of you're on the run you're under pressure you've got no resources you've got infiltrators in the fleet you've got factions pulling the fleet apart all that kind of crisis level stuff that's what drives the game pressure is a major theme in the game that's right what i say is that the game has kind of three components if you like action so space battles and fighting monsters maybe intrigue dealing with the faction politics and the infiltrators and drama so the the kind of interpersonal relationships but across all three of those sits the theme of pressure and the pressure that's coming down on your player uh, player characters and that's coming down on the fleet and and that's mechanized heavily in the game as well what mechanics are different in last fleet compared to apocalypse world the big one that i want to mention is the pressure mechanic I've taken inspiration from other games like Masks and Night Witches, uh, many others, I'm sure, where there's a kind of pool of in-game currency that you can use to boost your roles. And that currency is fueled by interpersonal interactions. So in this case, it's the pressure track. And your pressure track, rather like the XP track in Apocalypse World, is a five box track. You fill it up and when it maxes out, interesting things happen um, and in this case you can choose to fill the track up whenever you want to so anytime you miss a roll you can say oh i will mark some pressure and in exchange i will get a bonus to my roll so you can pretty much pass any roll you want it's not quite if you're all like a, if you're all snake eyes maybe not but probably you can pass most rolls if you want to but at the cost of increasing the pressure on your character Let's say you don't make it up to five pressure, you're, gonna, you're still going to want to get that pressure down. And the way the game does that is through various interpersonal moves that you use to build relationships or expose your character's underbelly, kind of put their heart on the line. And mechanically, that will reduce your pressure. Or alternatively, maybe you did make it up to five pressure, in which case you hit breaking point. And when you've hit breaking point, the only way to get out of breaking point is to do something extreme, something irrational or stupid or dangerous. It's a little bit like going into your darkest self in Monster Hearts. So in both cases, ultimately, it generates interpersonal drama back at the ranch. Powered by the Apocalypse is a little bit of a mixed bag in terms of if the game comes with a predefined setting or not. I think Rich and I spent an episode talking about this, but Mm -hmm. Apocalypse World Traditionally, like we have a couple of details here and there, but there's no firmly designed setting with explicit details. Last Fleet has some very explicit details about what happens to your character in certain circumstances and why you're on the run. Why did you go with the really defined setting approach? Yeah, so I I, I listened to that episode, Rach. I really enjoyed it. And uh, in fact, it was part of listening to that was part of what kind of crystallized for me the thinking about what I was going to do with setting in Last Fleet. I am a big fan of creating your own setting at the table, okay? And Last Fleet will let you do that. All of my games will let you do that and will give you the support to structure that conversation and make sure that what you're creating is going to be good and really drive some interesting situations in play. But having said that, I have observed over and over again that it takes quite a long time to get your setting started it takes you know sometimes you can lose more than a session even in getting this stuff started and it's uh, there's there's kind of some risks involved that are you going to get something that straight out of the box is going to reinforce the themes of the game that uh, you're trying to play and so what I've tried to do, I've tacked a little bit away. So I think that the typical PBTA game probably gives you a very broadly defined setting, which you then flesh out. And I've tacked a little bit further towards defining it. There's still plenty of gaps for players to fill. I think that's really important. But I've taken a kind of blades in the dark like approach of giving a little bit more 
specificity around these are the ships you're on these are some characters that you could pick up and use in your game and some situations that might be operating there and in this case of course there's the inhuman implacable inhuman adversary i like to call it so i've predefined that as well so that if you want to you can pick it up and play it almost out of the box and there'll be plenty of material there for you to get cracking with in a a one shot or a a really action-packed first session what's your favorite move in last fleet and why my favorite moves are the pressure reducing moves because you know that's fundamentally what i think is most interesting i love all of the space battles and the intrigue and hunting for traitors on the fleet or whatever but ultimately i find it most interesting when it feeds into your personal relationships there's a couple of them but my favorite is let loose and let loose is kind of the easiest way to reduce pressure in this game is to just head to the bar or head to the gym or head to the gambling room or whatever whatever it is you want to do and indulge your base needs and why i like this move no matter what you roll you're probably going to be able to reduce some pressure and you do that as a group too so it's like on a hit you get to erase one pressure but also anybody else involved gets to erase one pressure so straight away it's kind of incentivizing interesting group interaction Mm -hmm. but also regardless of how well you roll something regrettable is going to happen and the difference between a strong hit and a weak hit is more about how much say you get over what that something is. So I'll just tell you what the list of things is that could happen because I love them all. Depending on what uh, what you choose, you could end up in the arms of someone you shouldn't, share a secret that you shouldn't, make a promise that you shouldn't, or anger or alienate someone that matters to you. I just uh, all of those things are things I want to happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as you've been in a space battle. You're going to have spent a load of pressure. You're going to need to get it down somehow. This is the easiest way to do it, and it generates all that nice, sparky drama. The options presented are very immediately grippy in terms of, I want to see this happen. I know there's going to be bad consequences, but I also want to see those consequences happen. Mm, Exactly. Like I say, there's two moves. One of them is a bit gentler and nicer and about building up relationships, and this one's about kind of injecting some drama into your life. Well, Josh, you've got me certainly really excited to try out Last Fleet, so I think we should get right to it. Cool. Let's do it. That means it's time for our next segment, Act Under Fire, where Josh will run me a short session of Last Fleet. It is time to act under fire. Where do we start, Josh? I thought what we would do is use the first session stuff that I I mentioned earlier and hopefully demonstrate how it springboards straight into interesting interactions. Fantastic. So if we just really quickly sketch out the setting enough that we can have a common language, you're on board the fleet that has escaped from the ruins of the interplanetary commonwealth. You are on the big capital ship, the Agamemnon. It's a massive battleship with a bunch of smaller civilian ships that it's protecting. And you're being pursued by the Korax, who are this kind of extra-dimensional fungus network that are capable of absorbing the genetic and neural patterns of the people that they capture and making them into kind of spies and agents on their behalf. Okay. What, what we do here is we just ask a set of questions to set up what has just happened. So you've just escaped from a crisis situation. What was the threat that you were facing? I can give you some prompts here uh, if it's helpful. I think some prompts would uh, work out well. Yeah, cool. So the suggestions here are, was it an attack by an enemy fleet? Was it sabotage or an assassination attempt? Let's go with sabotage. Right. So what was damaged or destroyed by the sabotage? So I'm thinking of the context of Battlestar Galactica Mm -hmm. and the the Vipers are like the little fighter jets, right? Mm, Yeah. I think the fighter plane for our ace pilot was destroyed in sabotage. So, you know, they had a custom ship that was kitted out. They had done all these sort of tweaks to it that maybe our uh, people overhead weren't aware of. Uh, That ship's gone. It's not functional anymore. Okay. Well, in that case, I'm going to ask you what went terribly wrong during the crisis that made it even worse. 
I think what happened that made the crisis even worse is that the there was an explosive on that ship and it was meant to go off during battle and it actually went off in our hangar space. So that's now damaged. Yikes. Cool. So I'm thinking a number of planes probably got damaged in the explosion as well as there will have been engineers and maybe even returning pilots who could have been vulnerable to that. So that makes me wonder who got hurt during the crisis. Do you have a names list to go off of? Uh, yeah, I do. It's in the reference sheet right at the bottom. What, what? Okay, Josh, what's a good name that you think goes well with our setting? How about Isaac Seamark? You wanted to be a pilot or somebody else? Let's go with somebody else. Okay, cool. So I don't need a call sign then. All right. Isaac Seamark was hurt during this uh, blast slash disaster that occurred. And tell me a little bit more about what happened to them. So I think Isaac was one of our top engineers who was kind of in on what was going on with, uh, you know, starting to make these experimental tweaks to our planes. And then he was injured in the blast. I think the injuries are he's probably lost limbs which what do you what's more uh, upsetting to lose do you feel uh arm leg what do you think has the bigger biggest impact oh gee i don't know for an engineer probably an arm yeah yeah i think he lost his uh right arm in the attack okay it's pretty serious cool so that's probably given us enough to go on for starting with some interesting play but i guess we probably just need to establish what you were doing are you going to be playing isaac perhaps or are you, do you want to quickly um suggest a character i think i should play the engineer who was working below isaac so like isaac was my mentor and i knew a little bit about what was going on i didn't know everything that was going on i knew there was some stuff that was going on experimental stuff hey it's an ongoing crisis that we're part of we want to test this new technology that might not be approved for battle but we have to test it somehow but i don't have all of that knowledge yet mm, okay so your boss has just been hospitalized and your deck is probably still partially on fire and you're left in charge is that about right works for me Oh, awesome. Love it. I think we'll start with you having just got off shift. Okay. You've just spent the last few hours run ragged, trying to do Isaac's job, which you do not know how to do, really. People running up to you, giving you urgent tasks to do. Things are on fire. Ships need repairing. And you finally, you've got a moment to catch your breath. What are you going to do with that time now that you've got some space? I think the first thing. So I'm going to go with my character named naming her Florence. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I think Florence's first instinct when the situation quiets down and she has a moment to think is she immediately will go back to, I don't quite understand what Isaac was doing. I want to know more about what Isaac was doing because – God knows what state this man is going to be when he gets out of hospital and somebody needs to pick up the torch and carry it on. Okay. I think I want to do some investigating or somehow get access to computer files or records he had. Okay, let's do it. I'm just going to let you know that because of the situation you've just come out of, you start with two pressure marked on top of the basic two that you'd start with anyway. So you're at four pressure out of five. Okay. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah, you're under pressure. It's definitely. So it sounds like you are going to be seeking something out. So how are you going to go about doing that? I think Isaac's computer systems in the hangar were either destroyed or are not functional. So I'm going to try to sneak into maybe he's got like a data pad in his locker. I'm going to try to break into his locker, I guess, and see what stuff he has there that I could use to start my investigation. Okay, yeah, cool. So do you want to roll plus sharp to seek out something well hidden? For our listeners at home, usually the player characters have a plus one, but the stats roll a little bit lower in Last Fleet, so my character's stats are all plus zero. I rolled a seven. Cool, okay, so... 
that means on a 79, you get to choose one from the list. I'm going to attract unwanted attention. That seems fun and something we could act on right away. Yeah, okay, cool. So I'm going to introduce a character, Diana Loris, who is kind of a military police type character responsible for maintaining discipline and watching out for traitors in the fleet. So I think that you've just about busted into Isaac's locker and you're kind of riffling through his stuff. And you maybe managed to get hold of that tablet that you wanted. And just as you're coming out of the locker, you kind of close the locker and there she is standing behind the door, just kind of watching you with one eyebrow raised. So Florence's instinct, as pathetic as it is, is going to be to hide the tablet behind her back and be like, "Uh, uh, Diana, uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get clearance from you. I'm here just to pick up something for Isaac. He requested it. Sounds like you might be trying to cover something up. What, me, really? Covering something up? (laughs) I'm covering up with an eight. Okay. I think what happens is I'm going to choose uh, someone discovers the truth and will hold it over you in future. And uh, I'm just going to go for the straightforward, obvious answer is that Diana realizes exactly what's happening. You can see she kind of just looks at you. Both eyebrows go up this time. And she kind of tilts her head slightly as if as if kind of looking around your back. You know, you know, she can't see what's around there, but you also know that she knows you've taken something you shouldn't. And she says, um, oh, well, don't worry, Florence. It's good that you are keeping things under control in Isaac's absence. I think that's a really important job you're doing. I want you to report back in to Intel Ops later on and we can talk more about this. Okay. I would love to report later on. I'll let you know if I find anything. Please do. It's been a very serious event that's happened, and Intel Ops will be taking a close interest. Oh, I'm sure they're very curious about what's going on. I know I am. Run along now. We'll uh, we'll talk later. Florence sighs, knowing that she's, it's really clear she got caught and that this is going to spiral out of control at some point, and uh, walks off with the tablet is definitely feeling the pressure, I think. Yeah. And so the tablet, if you power it up straight away, you'll notice that it is open on a list of incidents that have happened in the engineering deck. Strange disappearances, bits of uh, repair jobs that seem to have been not completed or completed in an odd way. And you can see little notes that somebody, presumably Isaac, has written against each one of these. It looks as though he has been doing an investigation himself. Mm. Florence looks at all of these notes and looks at the pattern, looks at what Isaac has been investigating. And Florence really just wanted to know what tech Isaac was messing around with. And now she knows she's like really in over her head and she is going to have to give the military police at Intel quite the explanation and that this is the start of something big. Her natural reaction is, I am going to go and get blackout drunk before I start this next phase of my life. Awesome. That's definitely needed after everything you've been through. So do you want to roll to let loose then? Definitely. And that would be a six. That's an exciting result. Oh, okay. So it's up to you. You can accept that six, or you do have one pressure left that you can spend. That would take it up to a seven, and well, you would also hit breaking point if you do that. Breaking point sounds like a great idea. Let's do that. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so because it's a seven to nine, you get to choose the option, but I get to decide the details of that option and I'm going to make it something you'll immediately regret. I want to make a promise that I shouldn't. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. So I'm going to have another engineer show up at the bar at the same time, and they come and and join you. Let's say it is Felicity Kane. And Felicity Kane is like this young and thrusting, ambitious engineer 
who's been kind of on your tail as trying to get into the kind of second second in command position Mm -hmm. of course now she is in the second in command position because you've been promoted and so is she funny story so the two of you have some drinks together right and you get increasingly drunk and then she's she's kind of turns to you and says um so i noticed the uh the tablet you've been you were looking at before you seem to have something interesting there oh that tablet Oh, I was just reviewing Isaac's maintenance notes and making sure, because he hasn't been able to report back, obviously, what needs to get repaired or looked at next. Really? Because, you know, I've been I've been keeping an eye on Isaac myself, trying to get close to the, the guy, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, he seems to be up to some suspicious stuff, if you ask me. What tipped you off that it was a little bit suspicious? Oh, he's been snooping around all kinds of places I wouldn't expect him to, following some people. I don't know what he is up to. But then shortly after that, this explosion happens. I want you to tell me what's in that tablet. I think you found something interesting, haven't you? Okay, uh, MC, do you... Am I positioned? Do I have to give that answer right away? Uh, it's up to you. I think So you, you said you're going to make a promise that you'll regret. Okay, so Florence is going to turn to Diana and say, I haven't fully read everything, but I promise to you once I read all the documentation, I will give you a full debrief about what Isaac was doing. That's good enough for me. And I'll, I've got some stuff I want to share with you too. But right now, let's go get drunk. That sounds like a great idea. Great. And yeah, you end up blackout drunk as desired. So that means that... You, just uh, so we know, um, you will get to reduce your pressure by one. And if uh, Felicity was a PC, she would get to as well. So I did not hit breaking point? Uh, oh, haha. Yeah, I guess you kind of would have. Yeah, good point. Okay, so that's actually uh, even more interesting. So let's just pick a random playbook. What you have to do when you hit breaking point Uh, It means that you cannot reduce pressure by any means until you have taken one of the breaking point actions. So your options are to alienate someone who matters to you by lashing out at them emotionally, indulge your worst instincts, abandoning duty and or reason to heedlessly follow your impulses, publicly melt down through an emotional outburst or tirade, or take foolish action, putting yourself or others in danger without consulting others. I think this story today ends with in the process of getting blackout drunk with Felicity at the bar, Florence is going to have a meltdown about getting called out by the military police and everyone that's in the bar is going to know that. Oh, nice. Okay. That's that moment of anxiety that she's dreading is she's going to become like a tool or a spy instead of being the engineer that she really wants to be, that she's going to be an informant instead. Okay, and you're just loudly complaining about how terrible the situation is. Suddenly it goes quiet and you suddenly realize that everyone in the bar is kind of looking at you. And I think that's a good point to end that scene. Yeah, nice. Well, thank you, Josh, for running that short segment of Last Fleet with me. If people are looking to back Last Fleet, it should be on Kickstarter right now, correct? Yes, we are recording it in the past, but in the future it definitely will have gone live on Kickstarter. That's right. And we'll include a link to the Kickstarter in the show notes. So just check those out if you want to back the game right away. If people are looking to follow your work outside of Last Fleet, where can they find you? Yeah, so I am at Armada Josh on Twitter, which is where everything seems to be happening nowadays. Um, Or if you like a more long form approach to your game writing, I write about games and game design on blackarmada.com. Fantastic, and thank you once again for joining me today. Thank you, I had a great time. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community Richard Rogers and Rach Schalke. You can find us at gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at at plus one FWD. If you would like to support our show, visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash gauntlet. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Aural Hotbed CD, Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko, Metal Version, and Drowning Attitude. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Aural Hotbed on their website, www.savagearlhotbed.com. Thank <laughs> you.
Hey listeners, we have a couple of exciting things to tell you about. The first is that Codex Blood 3 is now available in the Gauntlet Patreon feed. Blood 3 is 62 pages long and features some amazing stuff. Blood and Mirrors, a vampire hack of Ebediah Ravishal's Swords Without Master. The Caledonian Boar, a game of heroism and myth inspired by the story game classic The Final Girl. Three Decisive Rounds, a two-player game about a pair of boxers and their hard scrabble journey to the ring. The Giant's Carcass, a new expansion for Trophy Dark. And the new missionally three dozen more cult horror movies. The second thing that we want to tell you about is Brindlewood Bay. Brindlewood Bay is an original game that combines Murder She Wrote style cozy mysteries with Lovecraftian horror. It's a full-sized, powered by the Apocalypse game coming to the Gauntlet Patreon feed in mid-January as a gift to folks who support us at the $6 or higher level. You'll get a PDF of the rules text, play sheets, and five mysteries, so you can start playing Brindlewood Bay right away. The game is another way for us to say thanks for all your support. There has never been a better time to be a Gauntlet patron. Head over to patreon.com forward slash gauntlet to get Codex Blood 3 and Brindlewood Bay before they leave the feed. <laughs>